Yes. Okay. Okay. So, um, hello everyone. It's our pleasure to have you in our today's uh, webinar. It's, uh, it is the fifth webinar in our April's webinar month for IEBS. And um, we had a very exceptional guest today, uh, Dr. Muhammad Rahal. Um, he's from Egypt and he's preparing a very nice presentation about implants. Uh, me personally, I'm very interested in uh, implants and periodontics, so I'm looking forward to it. So um, I would like to give uh, the floor to um, Mohamed Elias, our school secretary for IDS, uh, so he can start um, the, uh, the webinar. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. So if, it's a pleasure to have every one of you today. It's a special day. It's our last day for the school webinar month. It was a big month. And uh, for you that's, uh, that are still here, thank you very much. We are appreciative. I can see some names that uh, that we yeah, I've, I've learned some names, so that's nice to see you guys. Okay, so uh, today's we have a special guest, uh, Assistant Professor Mohamed Rahal. Uh, he's uh, he was he, he, he was a, he was one of my favorite guests to 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 speak to. He's a very honest, very upfront, uh, nice to work with. So uh, he's a prosthodontic and implantologist who has been working in his own dental office in Egypt since 2006. Dr. Rahal established his academic life working as a teacher assistant in the periodontics, diagnosis, and medicine department at Mr. International University, and then moved to the, to the prosthodontic department at Modern Science and Art University from 2009 to 2018. And he's an assistant professor. Following that, he worked as an assistant professor at Fayoum University from 2018 to 2021. So he's a graduate of the Faculty of Oral and Dental Medicine in Cahira University. He's a member of American Dental Association, and he earned his master and doctoral degrees in prosthodontics and implantology from Cahira University. Additionally, Dr. Rahal earned an advanced implant diploma from Naples University and Italy and fellowship in the Egyptian Society of Oral Implantology. So, uh, so it's nice to have you with us, Dr. Rahal. Uh, I'm going to give you the floor, and uh, we look forward for this session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mohammed, and thank you very much, Mariam. Um, uh, it's my pleasure to be with you today. And um, I appreciate this um, nice and wonderful uh, introduction. And I appreciate the opportunity uh, to be with you today, um, giving, providing this lecture. It's like a very basic and simple lecture about prosthodontics and implant dentistry. And um, um, I'll just add, since you already, um, I think everyone can see my screen, right? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. So um, I'll just add to what you said um, to this uh, uh, wonderful introduction that I'm currently um, I'm assistant professor at prosthodontics department at AT Still University in USA, in Missouri, in Missouri State. And I've been working here for almost two years uh, at the US uh, in this department, uh, uh, conducting pros and implant sessions. And before that, I was um, doing a fellowship at the periodontic department at the University of Kentucky at USA as well. So uh, just adding to what Mohammed was uh, um, introducing me for, and um, again, um, all uh, our amazing and wonderful uh, attendees, I'm so happy to be with you today. Please uh, feel free to leave any questions throughout the whole um, um, lecture uh, in the chat box, and I will definitely go to them and tackle them uh, after we're done. Or at least um, if we have like a break, a five minutes or three minutes break in between, we can, uh, discuss them. Again, I'm happy and I'm looking forward to the opportunity and let's start. Um, all right. So um, first of all, um, I'm happy to share with you that I just got elected uh, as an officer at the American Dental Education Association, ADEA, uh, for the implant uh, special interest group there. And it's a very, um, uh, it's an honor actually to be ranked this um, uh, position uh, in the IDEA, which is um, one of the greatest associations 
in the world uh, relevant to education. And this group is mainly to the implant group. So it's my passion actually. And um, going to uh, what's next, our lecture today is a prosthetic consideration before implant placement. So we're gonna talk about how would you deal with a diagnosis, how to diagnose your edentulous site and edentulous area before implant placement. How would you say this um, um, edentulous area needs a cement retained versus screw retained? How would you assess your restorative volume? And we're gonna explain what is the restorative volume and uh, the mesodistal space and the buccolingual width and all these aspects that should be, that you should bear in mind before your implant placement. And again, I always like to clarify this, being an implantologist and being uh, placing implants, it's not only about drilling. It's never always about drilling. It's about a prosthetically driven implant placement to place your implant in the most appropriate position prosthetically. This is what is really the success of implant placement. And again, one more thing I'd like to add, and I always like to keep repeating myself, the worst nightmare, the worst nightmare anyone could experience is a placement of implant, which is also integrated, but we cannot restore it. That's, that's the challenge. That's the nightmare. You have an implant, which is already also integrated to bone, but you cannot restore it. So uh, we'll take you from there and we'll start um, our presentation. Are you ready guys? Um, thumbs up uh, kind of interactions forever. For those who are ready, I need to see your thumbs up to start our presentation. Yes, there you go. Thank you, Mayar. Thank you, Arwa. Ananya, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly right i'm happy to be with you all and victor thank you very much good to see you audrey thank you awesome oh great group there and others any expectations if you have any expectations leave it in your chat and we'll uh talk about it i got like um all right Awesome, thank you, Audrey, for your congratulations. Now, let's start our presentation. Okay, so um, what's the implant restorative volume? The implant restorative volume is the amount of the space available for the actual implant retained restoration. So in order to know if you're gonna place implants or not, you have to assess this space and this volume. And when we're talking about volume, it, it is measured in what height, length, and angulation, and even the crown height space. So all these terminologies are under the word restorative volume. Let's talk at the first aspect, which is the mesodistal space. And actually it just passes un, um, unnoticed by a lot of um, implantologists, the mesodistal space. Like whenever we ask for a CBCT to check the bone, we check only the buccolingual width. And actually the CBCT is not as accurate uh, to determine the mesiodistal width. In order to measure the mesiodistal width, we need to um, measure it in intraorally or on the cast. So according to Carl Misch, I'm gonna start with the first aspect of the restorative volume, which is the mesiodistal space. The rule says, if the mesiodistal space is eight to 12, and the buccolingual dimension permits the placement of a five millimeter diameter implant, then it will have an adequate mechanical property. Let's see this example there in that picture. I hope you can see my uh, mouse over there. So if this is our missing first molar, and this is our implant down there, and in terms of buccolingual, it allows a five millimeter, and our space is eight to 12. Let's say it's a 10 millimeter or at least 12 millimeter mesiodistally. So when we say it's a five millimeter, we're gonna have like a three or four millimeters more, like um, 10 minus, if it's 10 millimeter mesiodistally, then 10 minus five, there will be five extra. So it's gonna be two and a half mesially 
and two and a half distant. So there shouldn't be a problem with that. But the problem happens, and again, I'm talking about the mesodistal. If you got a 14 millimeter space, the question is, if you place an implant of five millimeters, how many um, uh, mesodistal width would you have? You're gonna have, if it's a 14, you're gonna have an average or an estimate of 4.5 or five mesodistal and 4.5 or five distal. And that's a lot. For a crown, there would be kind of cantilever. Did anyone, have anyone heard this word before? The cantilever? You know, this game we used to play when we were kids, the seesaw. You put your brother and you sit there and then you suddenly run. So he just falls the other way. It's the same for the crown. So what happens here is the cantilever. And the cantilever would initiate a prosthetic problem. And this could end up with failure, even the failure of osteointegrated implants. It could be the start of the failure. So in that case, it's never wise. If you measured your mesodistal and you found it 14 millimeters, it's never wise to place an implant of five millimeter there because you're going to have an excess of the clusal table of the crown, mesially of five millimeter and distally of five millimeter. So this would be a horizontal cantilever, which might end up with failure, forces, magnified forces, and then failure. So in that case, in such case scenario, two four millimeter implants would be sufficient. And that would be very smart of you. So what we do here is to place two four millimeters implants or two mini implants in place. Like if our mini implants, and we're talking about mini implants, we're talking about narrow diameter implants. So we're talking about three millimeters. So the rule says the distance between two implants should be three millimeters. So the implant is three, the space is three, the other implant is three, and between the implant and the tooth is 1.5. So um, if, you, if you just add the, the, those numbers, it's gonna end up with the 14 millimeter. But in that case, we don't, we don't have this horizontal cantilever we had in the previous case. So whenever you have a large mesodistal space, instead of placing one large implant there, you can place two small mini implants and distribute your spaces. Does that make sense? If, if, if it makes sense, again, thumbs up. I'd be happy to see that. For those, if it makes sense, please tell me thumbs up. If you don't, yeah, there you go. I can see a lot of thumbs up there. Awesome, awesome, good job. So again, your mesodistal space is what dictates what implants are you placing. So now we're just following the proper diagnosis, a good diagnosis, mesodistally, and accordingly, we're gonna see if uh, we're gonna place just one implant or two mini implants in sight. And this is the cantilever we were talking about. It's like this uh, uh, thing we use when we jump in the pool, you know what it's called? It's a cantilever thing. So it's the same, this crown will be wiggly my son always used to say this word, wiggly. So this crown would be wiggly and then there would be magnified force and it might end up with failure. And again, to be smart enough, if you're gonna place too many implants in this space, although it's a one molar space, it would be smart if you have a sufficient buccolingual width to place your implants kind of more buccally and kind of more lingually rather than placing them on the same line because this would end up with a proper, a proper force distribution of forces. And if you have a case which where the mesodistal space is between 12 to 14 millimeters, we might go for some disking down there in order to reach to 14 millimeters in order to be able to place too many implants inside. So um, that's another tricky part. So if you have a distance mesodistally less than 12 millimeters, you can place one implant, that would be fine for the first molar. But if you have the distance, which is 14 millimeter and above for just one missing molar, you can place too many implants in place with one crown to avoid the cantilever. But if you have in between like 12 to 14 millimeters, in that case, it would be smart to do some enameloplasty or some disking between the teeth in order to allow the avoid any magnified forces or cantilevers. All right. So 
again, if you have a sufficient buccolingual width, place your implant a bit buccally and the other one a bit lingually, not on the same line. This is a staggered distribution or a tripodal distribution, which would allow the force uh, distribution in a better way and would, would reduce the uh, failures that could happen. Okay. Talking about the restorative volume assessment, another tricky thing that I would recommend you guys to do is always to start your wax up or set up before implant placement. We all know what's the wax up and we got like a virtual wax up nowadays that you can do. And this could tell you how much space do you need and how many implants you want to place and where are the sites of the implants. And in this case, this patient has extracted his central lateral canine and first premolar. But whenever you started the wax up because of the long time between the extraction and implant placement, there was a labial bone um, uh, resorption that happened. And this labial bone resorption ended up with um, placing your implants, half of it would be on the bone and half of it would be in the air because of the labial bone resorption. So can anyone tell me how to solve this situation? We wanna go back to the prosthetically driven site. Can anyone tell me in the chat? Or even, yeah, can anyone tell me how do you solve this situation? Screw retain, thank you, Mayar, that's, that's great. Or an angled, absolutely right, thank you very much. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. We can go for uh, screw retained restorations where we can place our implants on the crest of the bone and then the restoration would take the prosthetically driven placement. That's right. Or an angled abutment. Or be a third option, which is the GBR, like a bone grafting and doing two surgeries. Placement of bone and a bone graft and a membrane and waiting for healing six months and then opening again and placement of your implants. So. Um, you have one of the three options. It depends on what's your preference and the clinical situation, of course. So this is the actual implant placement for now, the surgically driven one, but the red one is the prosthetically driven one. So if we place the implants there, we would follow Maillard's opinion, which is placement of a screw retained uh, restorations or um, an angled abutments. But if we want to place our implants in the red side, in that case, we have to place a bone graft ahead and wait for healing and then place our implants. Awesome. Again, I'm just trying to clarify one of the rules that we should never forget. The distance between the implants and the natural teeth is 1.5 all the way, all the way from the crown to the roots. And the distance between the implants are three millimeter all the way up there and down there, okay? Awesome, great, great, great. And this was our first aspect in the restorative bull. So just to be, to be on the same page with you guys, can anyone tell me what was the definition of the restorative volume that we've discussed earlier? You can go ahead and write it in the chat or you can go ahead and say it if you want. Can anyone remind me what's the restorative volume? What does it stand for? Yeah, go ahead. I didn't hear that. Can you say it again? The space available for the restorative assessment. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's absolutely right. Which is the mesodistal, the buccolingual, occlusal gingival, the crown height space, and also the angulation of the implant. So the second um, aspect we're going to talk about today is the crown height space. And it's the vertical distance from the crest of the bone to the occlusal plane. This is the crown height space. It is the distance from the crest of the bone to the crown to the occlusal plane. It should be for the cement retained um, um, posterior restorations, eight to 10 millimeters. And for the anterior, it should be 10 to 12, which means before you doing your diagnosis, and before you placing your implants, you need to measure the crown height space from the bone to the occlusal plane. If it is in posterior region and it's eight to 10 millimeter, then it's fine. You have a sufficient crown height space to do your crown later on. 
and we should do this diagnosis uh, ahead. Uh, uh, there is a problem in the, the microphone. We, we lost uh, your voice. Oh, really? Now, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Now you can hear me? Okay. Okay, please uh, stop me anytime whenever you can, when, whenever there's a technical problem. Okay, so um, I was saying that the crown height space is, when it, for the posterior, it should be eight to 10, and for the anterior, it should be 10 to 12. And here, we are talking about the cement retained crown. We're not talking about the screw retained, okay? All right. And actually, the removable prothesis, if you're gonna implement an overdenture, it's going to be more than 12 millimeter crown height space. All right. So again, the posterior crown height space is 8 to 10 from the bone to the uh, occlusal plane. And the anterior crown height space is 10 to 12 from the bone to the uh, occlusal, um, from the bone, sorry, crest of the bone to the occlusal plane. All right. What if the crown height space, and that's a tricky part here, and I want you to interact with me in that point. What if the crown height space is not eight millimeter for the posterior crown height space? What if your crown height space, when you're doing your diagnosis before implant placement and you found it like 10 to 12 millimeters, which is way more than your cement retained crowns, how would you deal with that? Can anyone tell me? I would say, Screw retained could be an option for sure. Yes. And um, we got a range of the prosthetic options according to Karlmisch, which is the FP1, FP2, and FP3. The FP1, when you're just replacing the crown and it's just replacing the natural tooth, FP2, there's a portion of the root that you have replaced in your crown, which means that you will ask your laboratory to do the color of the crown and the color of the root. And the FP3, where you are simulating the gingival color as well. So we need to um, uh, touch base with this uh, classification according to Carl Misch, which is the FP1, FP2, and FP3. Okay, so that's the FP1. You're just restoring the clinical crown. That's the FP2. You're restoring the clinical crown and a part of the root. And the FP3, you are restoring also part of the gums with the crown. There are other options that you can do some graft, soft tissue grafts and so on. But this is an, a prothetic option. This is one of the easy prothetic options, especially if you have a proper shade for the gums or if the patient is having a low lip line, which means that whenever the patient smiles, the smile line, it would never show how tall and what are the shades of the crowns. Okay, awesome, perfect. So the FP1, it only replaces the anatomical crowns. There is a minimal loss of hard and soft tissue. And the bone and soft tissue must be ideal in volume. Um, sorry for that. Okay, and that's the FP1. So it's very similar in size to and contour to the most traditional fixed prosthesis or the crowns. Okay, and the materials that you can use for the FP1 could be a porcelain fused to metal or a zirconia-based restoration. The FP2, it's... Similar to it, but we having a more space. We're saying like 12 or 13 millimeters. It should be 10 millimeter as we've mentioned earlier, but now we have it like 11 or 12 millimeters. So um, in that case, we can restore part of the root. Okay. And the patient and the clinician should be aware of this, of this treatment plan from the very beginning, which means that you need to explain this to your patient. You have to tell the patient before the implant placement, well, in your clinical situation, we're having a clinical crown height space, which is greater than it should be. Therefore, in that case, we're going to have to um, go for um, an FP2 restorations where uh, there will be a taller crown, but with two different shades. Does that make sense? If it makes sense, thumbs up again. Let me see you guys. Yep, there you go. Thank you. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All right, beautiful. Okay, thank you. Let's go back to what we were talking about. We were talking about the FP2. 
Now let's go, what are um, the smile line classification? We all know it, of course. It's an average, low or high. The low is the most forgiving one and the high is the most challenging one. So if, if you got a patient, you're gonna ask him to smile and see how far is the smile line. If the gums are displayed, then you are dealing with a very challenging case and you need to be very meticulous in your prothetic options and vice versa, of course, if you're having a low smile line. And again, the materials could be PFM or, um, excuse me, uh, the materials could be a PFM or a zirconia-based restoration as well for this prothetic options. And you can go for some staining if you're going to go for zirconia. And we have another lecture with, where we talk about the different prothetic options according to the material in all the next cases. And we can tackle this one day for sure. The third prothetic option is an FP3 where we have to replace our natural teeth crown and there's a pink porcelain. And these are the Olin X cases, the Olin 4, that was uh, established by Paolo Malo at the very beginning. And in that case, you got a crown height space, which is way larger than 13. It could reach up to 15. So when you're restoring your crown, you need to restore the crown, the roots, and the gums. And this is by selecting the shades of the uh, gums to be more um, naturally appearance in that case. And the materials that you can use could be the porcelain used to metal with pink porcelain or hybrid restorations. And when we say hybrid, we're talking about PMMA with uh, cobalt chromium, for instance, and zirconia-based restoration. And the primary factor that determines the restoration material is the amount of the crownite space. If you got a crownite space more than 15 millimeter, it's gonna be a porcelain fused to metal. But I mean, less than 15 millimeters is going to be poor if used to metal. But if more than 15 millimeters, I would go for a hybrid restoration. Okay. And whenever we say the word hybrid, we mean the hybridity of two different materials, which could be a PMMA together with metal, two different materials. And then here comes the, uh, the how it looks like for the all on four cases which is the fixed detachable hyperprothesis or a screw retained restorations or what they call the fixed complete denture. The crown height space, 15 millimeter or more, that's the crown height space. What if your crown height space is more than 15 millimeter? What do you think? How would we solve that? Can anyone tell me how would we solve a crown height space more than 15 millimeter? I need to know your opinion. Any thoughts? You can write it in the chat or you can share it. You can just go ahead and open your mic and share it with us. Any thoughts? Mm -hmm. If you have a crown height space more than 15 millimeters. Okay, let me tell you that. That's, that's a bit tricky. So can you see those um, towers? According to Genis, those are the tallest towers in the world. So you got here, this one is in um, Kuala Lumpur, the Twin Tower in Malaysia. And that one is in Tokyo in Japan. And this one is Eiffel for sure in Paris, and the Broadway in England, and the Pisa in Italy, and finally Burj Khalifa in Dubai. So if you insisted on restoring your crown, you're gonna, you're gonna be included in Genesis accounts. Like you're gonna be one of the, one of those celebrities who did the tallest crown ever. And I wouldn't recommend that because this is another way of cantilever, which is the vertical cantilever, which would uh, provide us with uh, um, heavy forces and we could end up with the marginal bone loss. So in that case, if you, got, if you have a 15 millimeter or more, be mindful of the vertical cantilever that could occur, okay? We don't wanna to go to genus this way, okay guys? All right. Another problem when you restore this tall crown or tall crown height space, you're gonna have too much metal if it's a PFM. Too much metal would be uh, fabricated to support only a two millimeter of forcing. And this would act as a heat sink. 
which would result in porosities as well as the risk of fractures. So in that case, I wouldn't recommend using a PFM for more than 15 millimeters. And in that case, we can go for a milled restorations. That would be way better just to reduce the mechanical errors that could happen to this material. All right. Again, this is what we uh, mean by the heat sink. There would be more shrinkage, more porosities, increase the risk of the porcelain fractures, and increase the weight and cost as well if you use the PFM, especially if you're going to use a noble metal. So in that case, if you're insisting on a vertical, um, on a fixed restorations, I mean, and you cannot go for a removable ones, then go for a bone graft, a vertical bone graft or a vertical bone augmentation. Although it's not predictable, but it would be better than doing all these tall or long crown heights or a hybrid restorations, as we can see, which is the all and X cases or even an overdenture cases. All right. What if we have the other problem? What if we have the other problem, which is the crown height space is less than eight millimeters? That's another tricky clinical situation. I remember when I was a student and I always go to one of my faculties. This was a long, long time ago, probably 14 or 15 years ago. And I used to go to one of my faculty members and ask them for a partial denture. I would, I would ask him, is this um, partially dentures patient indicated for a partial denture or not, for a removable partial denture or not? And what the faculty used to do, they used to retract the cheek and ask the patient to bite in order to check the crown height space. If they have sufficient crown height space, they would it would be an indication for them, one of the indications for the partial, remove partial denture. But if there is no enough crown height space, like this case, if it's less than eight millimeter, what would you do in that case? You don't have enough crown height space. Can anyone tell me? Okay, I, I got a question from Mariam. Uh, could we add bone grafting or it would be too much? We can probably ask this question before me saying it, but we can definitely. But again, Mariam, it's not that predictable in these cases because as we know, as we go far from the periosteum, the blood supply would decrease and thus the vertical bone augmentation would be less. Thank you for your question. Keep asking me, guys. I cannot see uh, why it is a short crown height space. Okay, Mayar. Actually, uh, the, when um, the crown height space, if less than eight millimeter, this would affect, it would have a problems in the integrity of the restorations. So let me show you that. So if the crown height space to restore the implant posteriorly is less than eight millimeter, you will not have sufficient um, retentive walls for the cementation of the crown. And also you would not have sufficient material for the integrity of the crown. So this would definitely affect our crown. So in that case, sorry, I just keep going back. So in that case, you will lose the retention of the crown and you will not have in, in, inadequate, you will have, sorry, inadequate bulk of restoration, which could affect the strength and the aesthetics of the restorations. So um, Mayar is saying osteotomy. Yes, Asma, I agree with you. Osteotomy is a great option. Mayar is saying, I mean, if I can do a bridge or a crown in this same case, why would differ in case of implant placement? Okay, there is a rule. Thank you for this question, Mayar. There is a rule that says the crown height space for the fixed crowns, like the natural teeth crowns, crown and bridge, shouldn't be less than four millimeters. For implants, it shouldn't be less than six to eight millimeters for the posteriors. Okay, at six to eight millimeter, according to the literature, Carl Mesh mentioned that it's eight to 10 millimeter. So in that case, if you're gonna, if you have less than six to eight millimeters of the crown height space, this could definitely, definitely affect the integrity and the retention of your crown. It will not stay there for a long time. It will always fall down. So in that case, um, 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 it could be indicated for a bridge, for a fixed partial denture, I mean, but it's not indicated for an implant. I hope this answers your question, Mayar. Okay. And um, going back to the, our um, uh, case, 
if you got a case less than eight millimeters, um, uh, no, it could be a screw thing. Yeah, that's a good point, Mayor. Thank you very much. And this would be how to solve it. And this would be our next slide. That's so uh, smart of you. We can go for alveoplasty, as you guys mentioned. MashaAllah, you're doing great. And or we could engage the opposing occlusion, or we could go for a screw retained, as you mentioned, Mayor. And this will take me to the crown implant ratio. We all have uh, known what, what is called as the, excuse me, the crown root ratio. The crown root ratio in natural teeth is one to one and a half, but to crown implant ratio, it doesn't go the same. And that's my opinion. It's not an evidence thing. And whenever we say that the crown implant ratio is one to two, or even one to three, it doesn't matter to me. What really matters is the crown height space. And this will take me to this question. Why doesn't it matter? Because once the implant got osseointegrated to the bone, you're dealing with a shield. You're not dealing with a root, with the periodontal ligaments. So what really matters is the crown height space that we have mentioned, that what we have defined earlier. If you have a crown height space, a big crown height space, which is, for example, um, 15 or 16 or 17, uh, with, um, with an implant of also 16 or 17, it could still cause a problem. But if you have a crown height space of, uh, for instance, eight millimeters, and your root is just your implant, I mean just a five or six millimeters implant, which is a short implant, but it is also integrated, probably there might not be a complications. So again, I wouldn't consider um, the crown implant ratio as something significant to rely on. My only concern is the crown height space. Okay? I hope this is clear to you guys. And one of the biomechanical concerns of the excessive crown height space, why are we feeding the crown height space, is that it could end up with the um, stress concentrations, screw loosening, clues and material fracture, prothesis fracture, and attachment wear and fracture. And also um, increasing the prosthetic complications could occur with both cases, limited and excessive crown height space, okay? All right, any questions so far? Please feel free to stop me whenever you have any questions. Are we good so far? Shall we proceed? Some thumbs up for yes. All right, thank you. Okay, let's go. Awesome, awesome, thank you guys. Now. What we were talking about is, um, all right, thank you, Mariam. What we were talking about is um, removable implant restorations. In most of the cases, it needs a crown height space of more than 12 millimeters. So if you have a crown height space, which is more than 12, you can implement the removable options or screw retained restorations, which is for uh, all X, for example, okay? And of course, we all know that the most stress concentration that could occur in the high crown height space is mainly crestally in our implants. Just to proceed with our uh, classifications, we got the RP4 and the RP5. The RP4 it stands for the removable prothetic options as described by Carl Misch, where we got um, um, mainly implant supported removable restoration while the RP5, it's just, uh, it's a implant tissue support where, um, sorry for that, where we rely on both the implant and the soft tissue in our support because we have a minimal number of implants in comparison to the RP4. For the ball attachments, we would need a crown height space of eight to nine millimeters. For the bar attachment, we would need a crown height space for 14 to 16 millimeters. Another aspect that we need to talk about and tackle is the bone angulation. And this is kind of interesting. The question is, and I wanna, I wanna know your opinion about it. 
why in the upper or in the maxilla we need to place our implant tilted labially? And why do we need to place it tilted lingually in the mandible? Can anyone tell me? Can anyone tell me, please? Why would we need it um, labially tilted in the maxillary arch and lingually tilted in the mandibular arch? Yeah, go ahead. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Say that again. Mm -hmm. We got something in the chat related to bone fenestration, complication, as well as the quality of bone. The rich shape. Absolutely right. Convergence, aesthetics. That's another thing. Absolutely right. What else? We, all, of course, all know about the overjet and overbite, right? So the upper teeth are overlapping the lower teeth. So the upper teeth, most of the cases, should be like labially inclined and the lower teeth better to be lingually inclined. That's one thing. The second thing, as you said, uh, Mayor, it's uh, uh, Dr. Mayor, as you said, um, the shape of the bone. And that's a very, very uh, critical thing is that when we look at this um, um, a bone architecture down there, the one I'm pointing to, to the mouse, um, it says that, um, um, how it shows, I mean, that there is a lingual concavity there. And if you fenestrated this bone, you might end up with injuring of your uh, facial artery or a lingual artery, which is the branch of the facial artery. And this could end up with the bleeding till death. It could end up with the bleeding till death. So we should always be very mindful of this artery there. I'm talking about the artery in the uh, in the posterior lower, um, posterior lower um, uh, bone uh, in the premolar molar area, there's a lingual concavity that we have always to tilt our implants more lingually in order to escape from this, avoid this bone fenestration that could end up with the bleeding till death. And that's a very serious complication. So again, this would take me back to this slide Four, in the posterior mandible, the submandibular fossa mandates implant placement with increasing angulation as it distally progresses. And by the way, if you're not capable of tilting your implants clinically when you're placing it free-handed, go for a guide. It's not a bad idea. It's always a good idea to have a guide in order to be, to be mindful of how tilted you need your implants to be. Does that make sense? So again, we don't want to risk the patient life, okay? And the other factor, as we've mentioned, is the overjet and the overbite. Another thing that the upper central, remember when we used to do the setting when we were students, like the setting of the complete denture, we used to tilt our upper centrals a bit labially inclined. So again, the same way, the same exact way, you're going to place your implants there. Therefore, when you're placing your upper central, you're going to place it 12 degrees. And again, that's not an easy task, even for experts. When we're saying it's 12 degrees, it's nothing. It's almost like parallel to the long axis. So if you need a guide, go for a guide for that, like a fully guided, surgically driven implant placement in that case. Talking about the lower posterior again, the angulations could be 10 degrees to a horizontal plane in the first molar, 15 degrees in the second molar, and it could reach to 20 to 25 degrees lingually inclined in the second molar region, okay? In the anterior, the placement or your site of the implant placement, if it's a cement retained, your prothetic axis would be from the incisal edge. While the screw retained, it should come a little bit from the lingual surface in order to av avoid the display of your channels. But in the posterior, the site of the implant placement would be the same in the central fossa for both of them. Another rule, if the prosthetic axis that you're planning for is linear with your surgical axis, then this would be a perfect outcome. Like the prosthetic place of the crown. And again, I would always keep repeating myself, go for a wax up. Please go for a wax up before implant placement. During the diagnosis, go for a wax up, okay? 
So if your prosthetic axis is linear with your surgical axis, then you have a perfect outcome. If there is a deviation between your two axes within 15 degrees, you can either change the position of your implants or place bone or use angled abutments for sure. But if the deviation is more than 30 degrees, you're going to have to expand, graft, and even use angled abutments altogether. You can implement all these options at the same time. And if the two lines aren't even meeting, then you need a massive bone grafting or just go for an overdenture. So this is the way I should think when I'm planning for my implant placement. What is my prosthetic axis? And what is my surgical axis? There are two lines in order to plan for these two lines and how coincident, how coinciding they are, we need to decide what to be done for our treatment objectives and what treatment option could be implemented in that case. The last but never the least, in most of the full arch cases, I would rather go for um, a putty index uh, or even the all on X cases in order to determine how much buccolingual width do I have and how much occlusal gingival height do I have based on this putty index. But this is provided that I did a proper vertical dimension and a proper centric relation in my complete denture. So again, you should never place an implant for a completely dentureless case unless you did a complete denture ahead, just for diagnostic purpose. This complete denture will be your reference for your future implant placement. And this is like the UCLA abutments that we need to adjust based on this index that we have fabricated based on our complete denture that we have fabricated as well to know the crown height space, to know the occlusal gingival height, and to know the buccolingual width. So in that presentation, we have discussed the mesiodistal space the occlusal gingival height, which is the crown height space. And we have discussed the angulations. And the last thing, which is the buccolingual, which is the only thing that we can conclude from our CBCT. And this is most of the implantologists rely on for sure. So by achieving those four aspects, the buccolingual, the mesiodistal, occlusal gingival, and the angulations, now we are ready to place our implants. Um, that's my presentation today. And these are my contacts on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and my email for sure. And you can all, always scan this barcode for all the contacts, including even my number for any questions. I'd be more than happy to answer all your questions. Um, and I want to know if you have any questions for now, I'd be more than happy to know. Um, let me see, do we have any questions? Okay, Lara is saying, um, oh, thank you, Manar. Thank you, Manar, I'm sorry. Uh, it was my pleasure having you. And um, Lara is saying about the mesiodistal space and positioning of the two, it's mini implants actually, Lara, okay? Instead of one, uh, would it be possible to put one bigger implant, for example, six millimeter diameter? Even if we, that's a good question, Lara. Even if we place, large implant, which is six millimeter, which is the largest, I believe. And you got a space of 14 millimeters clinical situation. So let's say it's a six millimeter minus 14. You're going to have, how much would that be? Probably 14 minus six would be a nine and, <laughs> and, and um, 14 minus six. Someone was just uh, making funny faces outside my office. Sorry for that. <laughs> 14 minus um, uh, six. That was, I'm, I'm so poor, eight millimeters. So you're going to have like four millimeter medially and four millimeter distally. I used to have failures in my math class. So sorry for that. So in that case, that would be still a large cantilever, a large cantilever that would end up with a uh, failure for sure. So yeah, I would recommend too many implants. Thank you, Mohammed. That's my pleasure. Um, in which situations do you recommend the use of surgical guides? Okay, Asma, uh, that's a good question. I would um, um, I would say um, upper anteriors, to me, I would always use guides for upper anteriors because 
especially the upper central. It's very challenging. I would always go for guides. And uh, the lower uh, posteriors, if I've, if I've seen in the comb bean uh, that there is a decent bony defect or bony lingual concavity, in that case, I would definitely go for um, a guides because I've tried it myself and trust me, it's not a good experience to fenestrate this bone because it's going to be a nightmare if you found the bleeding, the patient sh should be hospitalized on spot. So in that case, it's, I would rather go for a guide. And another indication for a guide, whenever you're having your bone platform is five millimeter bone all the way horizontally, five to six millimeters with a flat bone, it's not like a, a pyramid shape. In that case, you could go for a guide whenever you want to. It's going to make your life easier and even no need for the um, uh, flap. Uh, you can go flapless. So I hope I answered your question, Asma and um, Lara. And um, Mohammed, thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Um, okay, Mayor, isn't the more bigger diameter come on the expense of utilizing bone volume? Yeah, that's the thing. And another thing is a cantilever. Yes, I agree. Uh, thank you, Asma. I hope it was outstanding. I hope you learned something from it. I'm always happy to share with you knowledge. What about com combining the multi-unit abutment with the straight abutments, Dr. Mohammed Saad? Uh, what about con combining the multi-unit abutments with the straight abutments from the biomechanical view? Um, that shouldn't be a problem. You can use the multi-unit abutments, um, um, multi-unit abutments, which is actually straight, and then you can place above it the type A or whatever. Yes, you can do that. Or you can place an angled multi-unit abutments. Um, and according to the biomechanics in the literature, there is nothing to say that there is a significant difference in the forces that is resultant from the angled abutments or the straight abutments. So biomechanically, they should be the same. It depends on what is your clinical situation. I hope I answered your question, Dr. Mohammed Saad. Thank you, Mustafa. Thank you, Arwa. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. That's my pleasure. I hope it was useful. Uh, what distance, Audrey, what distance do you prefer? Um, what distance do you prefer when you are close to the vital structures? A minimum of two millimeters, Audrey. Good question. A minimum of two millimeters as a safety margin. So for instance, if you have your... Um, canal for example inferior alver canal is like 13 millimeters i wouldn't go with an implant longer than 10 millimeters because i'm going to place my implant one millimeter subcrestally so it's going to end up with the safety margins of two millimeters only and that's the least okay so i hope this answers your question audrey um thank you lara nil i appreciate it um, okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed Saad. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you, Asma. Thank you, Jana. That's my pleasure. I'm glad you liked it. Awesome. Audrey, I'm happy to know that. Again, for any questions, you got my contacts. Feel free to contact me whenever. Thank you, Mohammed. I'm going to leave the mic to you and thank you again for the opportunity. I hope, um, I'm almost on time. I'm glad I'm almost on time uh, for our uh, session today. And um, thank you very much. All the pleasure was ours, to be honest. Uh, amazing. Thank you. From, uh, thank from you. The beginning till the end. You carried the whole webinar, to be honest. Generally, I'm, uh, I'm uh, getting uh, 10 minutes before to, to read the question and, uh, and uh, assist the professor, but I couldn't... Uh, <laughs> You revived, you're doing so great. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm used to this. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm used to this. this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. So, yes. So, guys, uh, I've shared the link for the certificate. Uh, if uh, please fill, fill in the feedback form if you want to get your, I'm going to share it again for you guys. And uh, thank you, Muhammad, uh, Dr. Muhammad uh, Marwan uh, for the, the amazing uh, webinar. If you guys don't have any questions for him, we can. Uh, can liberate uh, uh, our doctor. So, uh, do you guys have any more questions? 
All right. So, like Doctor said, you have his contact. Uh, so uh, it was amazing. Thank you for the bottom of Thank our heart. We really hope Thank to you see you very much. Much. And uh, and uh, have a great day, Doctor. Thank you very much. Thank you, you too. I hope you all a uh, great and a wonderful week ahead. And thank you again, Mohammed, for the opportunity. And see you all, guys. Take care. See you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye. We're gonna leave the session open more five minutes more for you guys, attendees, to to fill in the form. Then we're gonna close the session. Okay, I'm leaving. Bye, guys. Have a nice day, Doctor Mohammed. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bye, bye, Doctor. Thank you so much. Thank it you very a, much, Maria. It was our honor to have you today. And it's I enjoyed really, it. That, Me personally, I really enjoyed it. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much, Maria. Pleasure is all mine. See you soon. Inshallah. See you soon. Take care. Bye bye. All right, guys, we're going to leave the session open for five more minutes. Uh, fill in the form. Uh, so here is our score webinar March ending. It was a very nice month. Um, yeah, and, uh, we're happy about it, right?